Or, sorry. For this function, 6x over the quantity 3x minus 4. Look at the graph that you're seeing here. And then look at the table I made here. What am I doing to the x value in the table? 10, 50, 100. What's happening to x? Yeah, it's getting bigger. It's increasing. And what do you notice is happening to the y value, or h of x, is getting closer to what number? 2. And then here, as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger in the negative direction, it's also tending toward 2. So look at the graph here. This is a graph in an example yesterday where we had a vertical asymptote. Here's the vertical asymptote. It's not on the graph. We'll put it all together at the end. Forget the vertical for now. But this tends toward 2, and this tends toward 2. So y equals 2, y equals 2 is the horizontal asymptote. Now, how might that be able to be determined easier if you look at the function? Where do you see a 2 in the function? And it's not obvious. Mike? Say again? They're not doubling now, because this it, the second one doubled, this 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 quintupled, and then that doubled, yeah. That's alright. It guys, this is just taking a guess right now. Where do you see some sort of factor of two in the play? It's not obvious. Where might you see two? Look at the coefficients. Look at all the coefficients in the function itself. What becomes two? The actual function equals two. If I start to do what? If I if you substitute um, x for two of the exact equals two, this would be twelve over two. You'll get twelve over excuse me, six. <laughs> I guess you're thinking twelve and six is two if I have to look at them. I don't know. Like clamps or anything. Take them off the oh, hand clamps? Yeah, we you check all the tool sets in there? Where are the baby ones on the black brush? Um, in that cabinet, you're in, but there's also a bunch of tool sets in there that I can all touch. Yeah, I looked in them. Thank you. All right. Um, look at the ratio of the coefficients, the leading coefficients specifically. The numerator's leading coefficient is what? And the denominator's leading coefficient is? So if you look at the ratio of those leading coefficients there, you see 6 and 3 is 2. And really what's happening down here is, take a look. Look down at the bottom here. Think about end behavior as x getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. What's the biggest number we can contrive or conceive? What is it? Infinity. It's not even really a number, right? It would be constant for infinity. Now, so think about this as plugging infinity in for x. I get 6 infinity over 3 infinity minus 4. If I said to you, you know, you're walking down the street and you drop 20 bucks, it'd be annoying. It was 20 bucks, right? It's a lot of money. I think it's a decent amount of money. What if Bill Gates lost 20 bucks? Would he care, honestly? No. It's insignificant, right? So, 3 infinity minus 4, does that 4 have really any effect on it? 3 infinity is like such a large number already. So, it's not mathematically correct to do this, but conceptually, you can think about it as a covering this. What would you get? 6 infinity over 3 infinity, which is the infinities cancel, giving you 6 over 3. That's one way to remember this rule. Another way to do it, let's see if I actually show it. Wait, so you just put the infinities so you can cancel Yeah, it's not something that you would, you're, you're going to remember the rule if you look at the ratio of the leading coefficients. But if you want to think about how it's derived, this is one way, this is one way to derive it. I'm going to show you another way in a second. Okay, so think about being infinity in these spots. Well, 4 has no effect on the graph. If I have a million dollars and I lose a penny, it means nothing to me. If I have three infinities and I take away four, the four has no effect on the problem, really. So this reduces to like six infinity over three infinity down here, and those infinities kind of cancel, right? So you get two. Here, negative six infinity over negative three infinity, and because I have negative infinity there, the infinities cancel, negative six over negative three is still two. It's an easy way to remember if you forget the rule. Um, but what I want you to do instead, for now at least, and I'm going to show you how this works, is think of 
Let's see. Think of dividing the top and bottom by the highest degree variable. So what's the highest degree variable on the top and bottom for this function? One. Right next to the one. The highest degree is one. So divide the top and bottom both by x to the one. So let's practice this. Go up here and take this. and Divide every term by x to the one. What's 6x over x to the one? What is it? Just 6. Be careful. 6x over x to the 1 is just 6, right? In the denominator, divide these by x. These cancel. These cancel. This function can be written as 6 over 3 minus 4 over x. It's the exact same thing. It's in blue at the bottom here is the same thing as up here. If I plug in infinity for x now at this point in time, I'm going to get 4 over infinity. That's something that we haven't really talked about yet. Anybody want to take a stab at what 4 over infinity probably is? Almost nothing, and I heard 0. Now give me a reasoning as to why. It's a 4 to the total number, but you're dividing by every number. Oh, not every You're dividing it by a number that has no bound. Okay. Typically, it's basically minus almost nothing. You're subtracting almost nothing. You're subtracting almost nothing. Absolutely right. I'm going to give a, maybe a clearer explanation of that. You're right, you're subtracting pretty much nothing. Think about this. You've got a box, and in the box, it holds 12 baseballs. And they're all different locations. And if I take two baseballs out at a time, and there's 12 in their total, how many times do I have to do this? You did 12, you divide by 2, you got 6. If I take three baseballs out at a time, how many times do I have to do it? Four. If I can take six out at a time, though, how many times do I have to do it? So as I keep increasing by the number I'm dividing by, my quotient gets smaller, right? I divide by, you know, two at a time, it took six tries. I divide by three at a time, it took four tries. I divide by taking out six at a time, it takes two tries. If I can take out 12 at a time, it only takes me one try. But if I try to take out infinity at a time, it takes me zero tries in a sense. Okay, because your, your quotient is getting smaller and smaller and smaller every time. Wouldn't it still take you one time to yourself to actually physically take the baseballs out? If you physically did, but the concept of infinity is taking out all of, all of them and more at once. Let me, let me give you an, an easy way to think about this. Do this. Take 20, divide it by 2, 10. Take 20, divide it by 5, 4. Take 20, divide it by 10. You get two. So look at the relationship. As this number gets bigger and bigger and bigger, what's happening to this number? So if this number gets to be unbounded and becomes infinity, this number gets as small as possible but without becoming negative. What's the smallest number possible without being negative? Zero. So this number is getting smaller and smaller as it gets bigger. You can try your calculator. Take a very, very, very large number like 20 over 200 trillion you'll get a very, very, very small number. It's like 0 0.01. So as this number gets larger and larger and larger, this is getting smaller, making this overall fraction become zero, really. It's not an exact math or an exact value. That's where calculus comes into play. I'm kind of teaching you this concept without going into a lot of the ideas behind count. Okay? Mike, you had a hand up a minute ago. So what I want you to remember from this, this is not easy to remember that idea. So let's write this down in our table. When the degree of the numerator is equal to the degree of the denominator, look at the ratio of the leading coefficients. Okay, look at the ratio of the leading coefficients. So look at the ratio of the leading coefficients always. Okay, that's what the graph is going to go toward. 6 over 3 gives us 2. So the end maybe means where is the graph going toward as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger? It's going toward 2, the horizontal line. Let's look at another example to see this. So what's the leading coefficients? Are they equal in degree? Is one greater than the other? 
There's a degree. Degree of two and one. Do you have this degree or disagree? Only the highest. Yeah, only the highest. So it's just two. Be careful. Remember, degree is the highest exponent in each part. So in a polynomial, like f of x equals 2x squared plus 3x plus 5, the degree is just 2. So the numerator's degree is 2, and the denominator's degree is 2. So we're in a situation, again, where the degrees are the same. So once again, we want to look at the ratio of the leading coefficients. Well, what's the ratio of the leading coefficients here? 2 over 8. How do I know that? I go here, I look. Here's a 2. Here's an 8. So it turns out that the horizontal asymptote is going to be y equals 2 over 8, which is really just y equals 1 fourth. Now, it's very easy to take my word. Take out your calculator, please. Take out your calculator. Is that straight? Just want the calculator to see it. Go to y equals. Type this function in, but remember, please, that you need to put parentheses around the numerator and parentheses around the denominator. Both of these need parentheses now. Because the numerator is a binomial. It's got more, more than one term. So you need a major parentheses around the numerator and a major parentheses around the denominator. Now, once you've done that, go to your table and type in larger and larger values. Go to your table and make x bigger and bigger and bigger. Start with like, I don't know, 1. And go to 10, then 100, then 1,000. Yeah, look at your y values, please. Look at your y values as you make x bigger and bigger and bigger. Anybody not seeing the y value get closer and closer to 0.25? So what you should pretty much see is the y value eventually will pretty much become 0.25. This is what we're talking about here, about n behavior. n behavior simply means what's happening as x gets really big, what's happening as x gets really, really, really big in the negative direction also. So if you try to do the negative direction, you get the same thing. You don't need to do that, okay? Now, take a look at what I've done here, please. Look up. I've looked at the highest degree. I've noticed it's x squared. I took that second approach. If I divide everything by x squared, right, divide this by x squared, this becomes 2. Divide this by x squared, it's 4 over x squared. Divide this by x squared, it becomes 8. 
Divide this by x squared, it becomes 5 over x. Divide this by x squared, it becomes negative 3 over x squared. So this is another way to represent the same function from up here at the top. This original function we got can be represented this way. Well, if I plug in infinity now here, here, and here, all these terms drop off. Remember, write this down on the side. Anything divided by infinity is zero. Anything divided by infinity is zero. So all three of these terms completely drop off, leaving behind 2 over 8. Again, the ratio of the leading coefficients. Okay, this is what you're seeing down here. Right, the zeros all drop off down here, giving us 2 over 8. So we see that g approaches 0.25. So here is our conclusion right here. That's what you put in that table in the beginning there. So if you notice, this asymptote is not a discontinuity. Look, look at the graph carefully. We're vertical asymptotes, we could not cross an asymptote. Remember it approached it? With horizontal asymptotes, look what happened. What do you notice? It went past the asymptote, but then it came back. So it still tends toward it. But you can cross, write this down also. You can cross horizontal asymptotes, but you cannot cross vertical asymptotes. This is because vertical asymptotes are undefined locations. Horizontal or not. Again, vertical asymptotes are undefined locations, or obviously we call them discontinuities. So you can't cross them. But horizontal asymptotes, you can teeter back and forth about a horizontal asymptote and eventually level out. What's an example of that? Fun. You do it all the time. Specifically, you Luke. What's something that you like? What's one of your hobbies? Oh, you want a guitar string, right? Yeah. Guitar string, you pluck it. What happens over time? It starts vibrating, right? And over time, it does what? And eventually, it. So, a guitar string's amplitude on a sine or a graph would look like this. Like. Some sort of a wave, yes, a wave, that's a perfect example. Think about a wave, you throw a rock into the water, the ripples go off, but eventually what happens? They settle out, they dampen, it's where the word physics is dampen. This example here, it goes past the horizontal asymptote, but it comes back toward it. Anything that tends toward a specific height, the height in this case is 0.25, it's higher, 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 and then it gets lower, eventually it tends to 0.25, is considered a horizontal asymptote. It's also like a speed bump, right? Your parents drive from your, you're driving to school, maybe, you're leaving your neighborhood or something, and there's a speed bump. You hit the speed bump, the car oscillates, right? But eventually what happens? Yeah, it levels out. And hopefully it doesn't oscillate too much. If it oscillates too much, it's called an underdamped system. Ever see like those movies where a car hits a bump and you see the car like, doing this forever? And maybe it's hydraulics, maybe not. That's an underdamped system. It doesn't settle out quick enough. Your dampening, your, your, your car's shocks, the absorption of some sort of a perturbation, some sort of a push, is made so that it eventually goes quickly and settles out. It doesn't do this forever. And that's why you have shocks in your car. So again, a horizontal asymptote is something that allows or something that the graph tends toward, goes toward. It's like a target. Okay, a target. Let's look at the second example now, or the second case. When the degree of the numerator is no longer equal, but less than the denominator. What's the degree of the denominator in this example here? And what's the degree of the numerator? Zero. Zero. How do you know that? It doesn't have an exponent. Well, I think it does, Luca. I see an exponent. Good. It's really like having an x to the zero here. What's x to the zero? One. If it were zero, it wouldn't make sense, right? Can't put a zero there. That's really like a one. If I multiply the top by one, it has no effect. Remember, you can multiply anything by one. It's the same thing. So this degree is really zero. This degree is a degree of one. So the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator. That's this case that we're looking at right now. Okay, this is case two, right up here. 
So, as a result, one way to approach this problem is to start by just saying, plug infinity in for x. If you do that, you get 4 over infinity minus 1. If I take 1 away from infinity, does it have any effect on it? So I write it as 4 over infinity. Again, it's not mathematically sound. I'm trying to give you guys some alternate way of thinking. If we can do the same approach and divide it by x, so this is easier. So I get, I get rid of the 1, get 4 over infinity. Anything over infinity is 0. So when the degree of the numerator is less than the denominator, the graph tends towards 0. What example did you start the day off with that you said? Radioactive decay follows this trend. Radioactive decay follows the trend where eventually it becomes zero radiation. That's what this is saying. What is the line y equals zero? Does it become zero radiation? It doesn't. It eventually wants to go closer and closer like an acid door does. It gets tending closer and closer and closer. It doesn't actually touch it. What is the line of y equals zero? What's another name for it? What is it? What is this called? The what? Hey, can you close the question? What's it called here? Not the x-intercept. The x-axis. The line y equals zero is the x-axis. No, no, it was, sorry. I was not looking for anything complicated there. Here is that the line y equals zero is the x-axis. So any time that the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, the graph is going to eventually go toward the x-axis this way, and maybe over here also. Depends on the graph. Depends on the domain. But the concept is the same. But now the horizontal asymptote is physically the x-axis. Let's prove that using that other method instead of plugging infinity in for x. So look at this one here. The degree of the numerator is what? What is it? Zero. Careful. Is an x there, right? The degree of the denominator is? Two. Right? Look at the exponents. Come on. I shouldn't have to wait for that answer. x squared in the bottom makes it two. x squared in the top makes it one. So the degree of the numerator is clearly less than the denominator. So we know already it's going to go to the x-axis. We know that already by our rule, which is so. Let's think about this though. Divide everything by the degree of the numerator. Everything. Divide this by x. This becomes negative 5. Divide all of these three by x. This becomes x plus 4 minus 2 over x. Well, if I look at this now, and I look at this representation, and I plug infinity in for x, I'm going to notice I'm going to get negative 5 over, well here's an infinity, the 4 has no effect, and then a 2 over infinity is really 0, so this drops off and goes to 0. This has no effect on infinity, so I still get something over infinity. And again, anything over infinity is 0. Even if that's negative up top, even if the numerator is negative up top, it doesn't matter. It makes no difference. Anything over infinity gets closer and closer and closer to zero. So for this one, for the second case, here's our conclusion. If the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, the horizontal asymptote is y equals zero. Go back to the first slide and fill that in. Case here. If the degree of the numerator is greater than the degree of the denominator. So we did equal to, we did less than, now we'll see what if the degree is greater than the denominator, and specifically by one. It could be greater than more than one, but you get a different, interesting looking asymptote that it's not really applicable on any level of math at all, really. Okay, so what we're going to see here, look at the degree, the degree of the numerator is what? What is it? Two. The denominator? Louder? One. Okay, again, look at the exponents only. Just look at the exponents. The degree of the numerator is greater than the degree of the denominator. So the problem is, if we plug infinity in, what do we get? What do we get? Yeah, we get infinity, infinity squared over infinity, which kind of reduces to infinity, but it doesn't tell us much about the graph. We want a number. Right? We want some sort of a 
numerical value or expression at least, at the minimum. So what we're going to see is that the, the, the function is what's called unbounded at this point. It doesn't converge. The graph kind of goes off to infinity here, off to negative infinity here. But the question we want to suppose, or the question we want to consider is, well, in this case, what if I look at the actual quotient of this? How would I divide those two? How would I divide them? Think back to chapter 8. You could factor, that's one way. Does the numerator factor? What does it factor into? And negative 1. Does that cancel with the denominator? So factoring is going to help me. How else can I divide? What do we do in chapter 8? And you can kind of read ahead. It's in the paragraph. Go. No, we're not going to multiply both sides by x plus 1. How would I find this quotient right here? Synthetic. Yeah, either synthetic or long division. Either one. Guys, it's right here. That's why I said we're going to read ahead again. Synthetic or long division. That's how I would divide two polynomials. So let's do that. So if I want to divide this by x plus 1, I have to put a negative 1 out in front. Okay, this is not a simple, simple thing to you right now. It's not like an easy reminder. You need to go back and restudy chapter 8, especially what we did with synthetic division and long division. So if I take the numerator here, its coefficients are 1, 3, negative 4. Those all go right here. Remember that this is really x minus c. So c in this case is going to be negative 1 out here. I run this through the table. I bring down the 1. Negative 1 times 1 is negative 1, and 3 gives me 2. Negative 1 times 2 is negative 2, and four, negative 4 is negative 6. So I'm going to get 1, 2, negative 6, which is this right here. Remember that when you divide two things, you get a quotient and then a remainder. So the remainder is the 6. Now it's negative, and it's over what the divisor was. But I'm thinking about the graph as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger or as x gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So if I plug infinity in here, what is 6 over infinity here? Zero. Zero. We've been saying that over and over. So cover that up. What are you left with? What is it? Y equals mx plus b. Yeah, y equals mx plus b, or x plus 2. So x plus 2 is this dashed line you see. And look at the graph. The graph happens to be bounded by that dashed line perfectly on both sides. So we call this a slant asymptote. Again, we call this a slant asymptote. The slant asymptote is the equation y equals x plus 2. Okay, and again, this only works if the numerator's degree is one larger than the denominator, specifically one. If it were more than one degree larger, it would be what's called a parabolic asymptote. And the graph would look kind of funky. Here's what it would look like. Imagine you had an asymptote that was a parabola. The graph might do this. Maybe there was also a vertical asymptote. Oops, I should do that in black. Okay, if you had a degree of the numerator that was two greater than the denominator, the graph would look something like this. It would move right along with the parabola. We're not going to get into that, so you don't need to write it down. But if the degree is more than one larger, it's a parabola. And then it would be a cubic, etc., etc., etc. Okay? So in this case here, what it turns out that we're looking at here is always going to be some sort of a slanted line. And then the graph will tend toward it on either side. So maybe this side will look like this, and this side might look like this. Okay, but notice at the ends, not in the middle, but at the ends, as it goes toward the ends, it goes toward the asymptote always. It rides along the asymptote. Just like when it rode along the other asymptotes, it rode along the horizontal asymptotes. Now we're looking at a slant one. For these problems, I want you to use this table here. Okay, that's what you were filling in the beginning. 
So in case one, when the degrees are the same, look at the ratio of the equal coefficients, and it's horizontal. When the degree of the numerator is less than the denominator, it's y equals zero, which is related to the x-axis. And the third case is what we just did. It's the quotient of either long or synthetic division. When would you use long division and not synthetic? Why would you use long sometimes and not always synthetic? If there's like a exponent. Yes. If the denominator is an exponent greater than 1. So scroll down real quick. Look at number 4. Number 4 is definitely a slant asymptote. But can you divide using synthetic division for number 4? You can't. Can you be using synthetic for number 5? But it turns out you can also factor number 5. Try that. The whole slant asymptote. Um, number 6 is the same, so it's not going to help us. Okay, but number 5. Number 5 is really interesting. Let's do number 5 together. Let's do number 5 together. If I try number 5, and I just went right into it, and I use synthetic, it would be this. And I would get this. Negative? Yep. But I want you to see, that, see what's going to happen here. Is it going to have the same idea? Negative 4 and 0 is going to give us negative 4. 16 and negative 16 gives us 0, which gives us this as an answer. Oops. It should be a T, not an X. Same, same difference, right? What do you notice when there's no remainder? Here's your slanted asymptote, right? X minus 4 is the slanted asymptote. Well, if you graph this, and you noticed this yesterday, what did you notice about the graph? What does the graph of number 5 look like in this case? Yeah, but not four. What was it? Yeah, so here's what it would look like. Open circle and continuing. Okay, again, think about it. If I factored this, it becomes t plus four, t minus four, all over t plus four. This click, yeah. Oh, go, go. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah. T plus four cancels. That's the hole. That's why there's a hole there. I'm sorry, it should be a negative one. Something was up to the graph here. Okay.